Hi everyone, it's Quickie Baby and welcome back to World of Tanks and boy have I got a video for you here today. This is the first ever Czechoslovakian tank destroyer and I'm going to be giving you a full review of it. It is the SH PTK TVP 100. Now if that's a mouthful I hope you'll forgive me for calling this the TVP 100 throughout this video. This tank destroyer has a fully traversable turret, a 100 millimeter main gun. It doesn't have an autoloader but it has a whopping rate of fire that you can get down to about four, four and a half seconds. Reload combined with 250 alpha damage, standard on 100 millimeter, but incredible penetration and awesome high explosive rounds. Combine that with a fully traversable turret, which actually has all of the shells, which is visible from the inside. More on that as we're gonna be dipping into the gameplay later on. And this thing is a fast, all-purpose, voracious beast, which deserves your attention. So before I jump into the gameplay, let's do a full comparison of this absolute enigma of a tank so you can see how it stacks up compared to some of its competition. So when I was thinking about what do I compare the TVP-100 to, there's a wide variety of other turreted tank destroyers in the game, but they don't really have the same kind of gameplay. They're lacking the gun handling, quite a lot of them are lacking the mobility, or they're just lacking the raw firepower that this tank has. I personally feel that the best tank to compare the TVP-100 to has to be the Kampfpanzer 07RH, which is a German medium tank, and also one of the most popular premium tanks in the game, it is the one and only Scorpion. So immediately, right off the bat, we see that the TVP-100 is packing a staggering damage per minute with its standard ammunition of 2,777. That gives this vehicle one of the highest DPMs that you can get at tier 8. It's not quite as good as the non-turreted tanks that you can see here, such as the Turtle, the Tiger 88 or the TS-5, but it is not far behind them. When you combine this with the fact that the TVP-100 has one of the best penetrations of any tier 8 tank with 270 on its standard ammunition, this is an outrageous gun to have on a tank with a turret. It kind of feels a bit more like tier 10 medium tank damage per minute in a tier 8 tank destroyer package. Now what's even more crazy about this is that that's with the standard rounds and for some reason Wargaming have given this thing outrageous high explosive rounds where the damage pumps up to 420 and it's got more penetration than you would expect for a 100 millimeter gun at 100 millimeters. If you can manage to make the high explosive rounds work with this vehicle, you have 4,666 damage per minute, allowing you to rip apart multiple tier 8 tanks every single minute. Of course, if you can make that 100 millimeters of pen work. To let you know how crazy that high explosive damage per minute is, let's compare the TVP-100 with its high explosive rounds to the highest damage per minute tank in the game, the Tortoise when it's using high explosive rounds and the vehicles using vents as well. The Tortoise gets just shy of 5,600 while the TVP-100 is nearly at 5,900 damage per minute. This will be the highest damage per minute possible in the game outside of an autoloader if you are penetrating those high explosive rounds. And considering that intuition is in the game now and it's easier to be able to use them than ever, it's definitely an ace up the TVP-100 sleeve that cannot be ignored. Now, to add on to the fantastic 270 standard pen and those great HE rounds, this vehicle also has high explosive anti-tank rounds with 330 millimeters of penetration. However, that is incredible in itself, but the 250 alpha damage for a tank destroyer and the fact that those shells cost 4,800 credits per hit, you are hemorrhaging credits if you decide to fire gold with this tank. It makes it an incredibly expensive tank to play if you are only firing gold, but you can go through the, the front of a mouse very easily with the high explosive anti-tank rounds on this tank, and it gives it one of the best penetrations, if not the best penetration of any tier eight tank. Simply outrageous firepower on the TVP-100 where it is focused. One thing that does suck about this vehicle, however, is the shell velocity. 897 on its standard rounds. When you combine that with the fact that it has high explosive anti-tank rounds that I believe have even worse shell velocity, yeah, down to 795, that is not great at all. So be careful, this thing needs to be able to lead well against tanks. It doesn't feel very comfortable shooting at very fast vehicles. 
So now let's move on to the gun handling. Let's see if the TVP can continue this momentum of its firepower. And yeah, it does. 1.3 seconds aim time, 0.3 accuracy, and really good gun handling for a turreted tank, which is better than on the, the Kampfpanzer 07 RH, which means that this tank, although it can't use vertical stabilizers, even if it could, I probably wouldn't take them on the tank anyway. You could use a rotation device on this vehicle, but considering that the aim time and the gun handling is good enough and the turret reverse speed is not even that bad at 32 degrees a second, that, that frees up a whole extra equipment slot for whatever you would want. This gun handling is outrageously good on this tank, and it does feel more like a medium and a very good medium compared to a turreted tank destroyer. Just look at what it does to the Scorpion. It's literally got half the dispersion and nearly half the aim time of a Scorpion. And that's a tank that already feels quite comfortable with the gun. One thing that does suck about the TVP-100 though is the six degrees of gun depression, however, so don't think you're gonna be able to work a ridgeline like a medium tank could. So now onto the mobility. And this tank, it's not outrageously quick like the, the Kampfpanzer is, but it's not slow. 55 forwards and 20 backwards gives you more than enough to be able to get into position quickly and to even be able to run rings around your opponents. It's kind of just as fast as a scorpion and it's actually got better ground resistances which kind of makes it faster on medium and soft terrain even though its power to weight ratio is a little bit more limited. As I mentioned the turret traverse on this tank at 32 degrees is not horrible like on other turreted tank destroyers like the scorpion. Hence why I don't really feel like it needs a rotation device and you can invest that into other aspects of the tank. But go for a rotation device if you want to take this thing to the extreme and really have kind of medium tank turret traverse and incredible gun handling. This tank just is getting better and better and better all the way. It's got best in class firepower, I would feel. Best in class gun handling. Pretty darn good mobility right um, up on the upper level. But what about the armor? Well, yeah, it's not great news for this tank. 65 millimeters of turret armor on the gun shield and on the hull and 40 at the side means that while you're not like a scorpion which is easily going to get penetrated by high explosive rounds it's definitely not good news. The TVP 100's model as we can see has about 90 millimeters of effective protection on the gun shield. The hull armor about 184 definitely not great. However one thing I will mention about this tank is that it's actually pretty okay at side scraping, apart from, as you can see, that they can manage to overmatch this underflap here with only 61mm caliber guns. So be very careful when you are side scraping in this tank if your opponents are slightly below you, because they're going to be able to not only track you most likely, but also be able to enter in your vehicle. Nevertheless, side scraping in this tank can work. You probably want to angle your turret out like this as well to maybe try and bait your opponents into messing up against the uh, the front of your gun shield or to bounce off the side of your turret armor. But be warned, this tank cannot side scrape against 121 millimeter caliber guns and larger as they're going to overmatch your side armor. Hit points wise, disappointing for when you want to, if you wanted to be a medium, but it's not bad for a tank destroyer at 1,150. And I thought that it would be substantially lower to truly make this thing a glass cannon. Now onto the miscellaneous stats. View range, 370. It's not awful compared to something like a Scorpion. It means that this tank can definitely use coated optics and still have very decent view range, but it's not as high as a medium. When we take a look at the camera rating of this vehicle, it's actually got very, very good stationary camo. Its move, its camo on the move is not quite as good as the Kampfpanzer, but it's double that of the Scorpion, which allows this thing to make outrageously aggressive plays and not get spotted, unlike the big cumbersome German tank. So how do I recommend setting up the TVP-100? Well, I'm personally going to use a gun rammer, coated optics, and I'm going to be using a turbo on this tank. Now you could drop the turbo out alternatively to maybe use a rotation device if you prefer that. But for me, it was more about boosting up that engine power and being able to go forwards at 60 and backwards at 23 that gave this thing the mobility that I wanted. And I feel like its gun handling is good enough already without using the rotation device. My second build on the TVP-100 was dropping the turbo to use an exhaust system to then give this vehicle just shy of 29% camo when moving to allow you to make your more aggressive flanking plays, maybe on maps such as Prokhorovka, where you want to be safe rather than fast. A lot of you might be interested in the crew that the first ever Czechoslovakian tank destroyer uses, and it's kind of identical to all of the mediums. You have a commander, you have a driver, you have a gunner, and you have a loader. 
and the commander is also the radio operator which puts pressure on that slot. Accordingly, if you want to prepare a crew for this tank, I thoroughly recommend that you focus in on having a premium crew member as a commander. Maybe try and take one from the personal missions or maybe from the, the event that just passed. And you can probably get away with standard crew members for your gunner, your driver and your loader, but your commander must be premium as they're going to have to take Brothers in Arms, Sixth Sense, Situational Awareness, Recon, camera rating and probably even repairs before you even start to feel remotely competitive on the tank. And this vehicle does have access to sniping field mods. And so I'm personally going to end up taking reinforced suspension because I want to improve the ground resistances and also my suspension durability. I'm going to improve the accuracy of the vehicle at the expense of a little bit of the aim time, but both of them are already incredible. And can you believe this tank is getting down to 0.26 accuracy outrageous? I'm going to take the view range because I'm not an idiot and the concealment after firing is pretty much irrelevant on this tank. And then finally, I'm going to take a scouting slot, which means that with a good crew and a premium consumer ball and coated optics, I can get up to 474 meters view range. But even if you weren't using the Bukhti, you can still manage to get yourself above 250 when your commander is up to scratch. So all in all, the TVP 100, this thing is outrageous with regards to its statistics. Why don't I show you what I was able to do with it inside the gameplay? <laughs> All right, so we're rolling out on Overlord in the TVP 100 in a tier 8 matchup. And spoilers, this was my first ever game that I played in this tank. It's going to be a learning process as we manage to get through. Now, when I'm playing on Overlord, I really like having a turreted tank destroyer. I would love to have a little bit more gun depression than the 6 degrees of gun depression the TVP 100 gets because it's just not quite enough to really work these positions. Without kind of getting right in there and getting right up behind that batch at 12T, I can't really sit behind the ridgeline like I could do with some more flexible tank destroyers. I'm looking at you, G-Saw. Uh, but of course, the G-Saw has half the DPM that the TVP 100 has, and, and this vehicle, it's, it's kind of just hitting as, as hard, especially if you're managing to go with the high explosive rounds on this tank. You're actually hitting harder than you would be with the G-Saw. One thing that I want to highlight is just how, look, give Wargaming credit where credit is due. When they've made this vehicle look absolutely awesome on the inside, look at how all of the ammo is stored inside of this tank. I love the way that the shells are all placed. I love the extra shells at the back. This is a really cool design. And I have to admit, at this stage of the game, I was kind of just having a bit of a look around. And when you see the turret turn throughout this uh, game, when I'm in third person, have a look at how cool it is that you expose more of the shells towards the left and the right. Oh, it looks absolutely fabulous. Um, it's a little bit distracting at first. And then hopefully after a while, you kind of forget about that. And you actually just want to focus on, uh, yeah, destroying your opponents. So the first few minutes of this game are going to be incredibly chill. And what I want to highlight is how good this tank gets later on in the battle. This is not one of those kind of tanks that you want to be high progressive and go and get forwards and go and get on a ridge line and expose your turret armor. Of course, the tank doesn't have any and not try and set up for an ambush. That's what you want to do in this tank. You want to set yourself up for an ambush. You don't want to jump straight into the bath and, and risk boiling uh, certain aspects of yourself that you may not want to. But just like put your feelers out, dip your toes in, see where your opponents are going to be and look to see if you have opportunities. Now you might notice that uh, I didn't fire at the LT-432 there. It's because I'm still kind of worried about giving away my position. We don't know where the SU-130PMs are and if they're sitting in the bushes just opposite me and I get spotted by this LT-432, it's not going to be happy days. Nevertheless, we decide to fire there and pull back as quickly as we can. Getting spotted, no harm done. We managed to track the LT-432. Unfortunately, there's no follow-up damage from my team. And you can see I'm starting to get a little bit antsy. I'm like, oh, I can't wait for this bath to kind of cool down a little bit. I kind of want to get stuck into it. So I'm going to use the fact that my L, uh, LTTB has pushed down the eastern flank and tried to get out some view range to now try and make the play that I usually would do in my turreted tanks, thinking, do I play like a medium? Do I play like a tank destroyer? What do I do? My team are already down by three vehicles and nearly 6,000 hit points. And because my team doesn't want to extend, I was getting frustrated there and thinking, am I going to lose the very first game that I play in the TVP 100? 
So now that my team have basically said that they don't want to commit down a flank where maybe there could be SUs at the back, maybe there wouldn't be. Oh, first HE shell doesn't quite manage to connect. The shell velocity on this tank does take some getting used to. Having only 900 meters a second on your rounds or even less on your high explosive anti-tank, which is down to 795, really doesn't make this thing very good for engaging vehicles that are rapidly moving. Now, ah, uh, at this stage of the game, I was thinking, okay, well, maybe I can at least try and do some damage in this brand new tank. And for some reason, that Senlac has really good camera rating. We're unable to be able to catch a glimpse at them. We are down by double hit points, down by four tanks, and I haven't even done anything in this game. Yeah, okay, but let's let's start on the STA-1. Let's begin. We've got our first shot in. We're going to get our second shot in. And look at this thing's DPM. Going to shoot at the LT-432 here to hopefully finish them off. Unfortunately, even with the accuracy, our shell just dips into the ridge and we're unable to shut them down. However, the STA-1's dead. Also, the LT-432 dies with our vision. And now we can go after this somewhat SM. Fires one shot into me, but I managed to put two into him, out-trading him. And his second shell manages to, I guess, just hit my track, but doesn't even manage to fully take the tracks off. And look at this thing's voracious rate of fire, ladies and gents, boys and girls. Looping a shell over there with the fabulous accuracy that this tank has. And also, do you know what? The shell velocity actually helps with kind of looping shells slightly over ridges. It won't be very good for shooting up at tanks, let me tell you. It's going to be horrible trying to shoot uh, tanks that are above you or on a horizon because of the way that the game compensates for distances. But in those kind of scenarios where you just want to loop a shell over a ridgeline, there's no harm in almost like auto-aiming in certain scenarios when the vehicle is just behind the ridge or even just, you know, trying to aim slightly low on the tank to adjust for the, um... I'm getting distracted by the fact that there's a guard that's managed to go on upside down there to be able to adjust for the vehicle's low shell velocity. So I'm expecting the Samar SM to come out. Now I'm going to reload a high explosive anti-tank round. And remember, these things have got 330 millimeters of penetration. You're going to be able to butter your way through the front of everything with this. So I decide to try and shoot the tracks there on this tank to lock them in place, fire one more heat round, and now go after the AP rounds. And this is where this thing is just... You don't want to sit in front of this. This is one of the last tanks in the game that you want to sit in front of. Unfortunately for me, there's an IS-6 behind. Now, if I was a, a Scorpion, that would be a problem. But I'm not a Scorpion. I've got a very good traverse speed. I've got a very good rate of fire. And perfect to be able to finish off that IS-6. I guess he thought he was getting the jump on me. But in fact, we were shutting them down. And we should have the gun kill here on the on the 110. Unfortunately, it doesn't go in. But you get to follow it up with another shot. And even though we started with pretty much nothing in this game and down on double hit points nearly, we are starting to make our way back. And oh dear, ISU-152K. Very dangerous from the front, but not so dangerous from the side. And it's just outrageous how many shells you can get in. We penetrated three shots there. That is 750 average damage that we should have done to the ISU-152K. And we've got all of the mobility and all of the flexibility to be able to just keep trying to deal with our opponents. All right, so in this situation, I was a little bit worried about the fact that I was about to get surrounded by the Samoa SM. I was also worried about the fact that the Ferdinand might be sneaking their way up along the coastline here. So I shoot the tracks of the Ferdinand, lock them in place, hoping that I'm going to be able to get the second shot off. I have to fire through the upper hull. And right now, what I want to do is just lock down this player's tracks and then try and get to the side to start to carve them up. They actually use the 90mm gun and they managed to put one into me there. But look at this mobility. Is this a medium tank? Is this a tank destroyer? It's a, it's a medium tank with tank destroyer DPM. The Samoa SM is trying to sneak up on me from above. I'm just going to have to keep trying to grind this Ferdinand out. And unfortunately for me, the ISU sneaks up just before I'm able to destroy the Ferdinand. We put five rounds into that tank. That's 1,250 damage. And we were able to also use our crazy rate of fire to lock the tracks down to the Ferdinand. This thing will be an insane counter for any non-turreted tanks. And we turned what was looking like an absolute disaster of a game into 4,400 damage. And we undoubtedly clawed our way back into this game. And we've now even given our team a chance to be able to, uh, to take this one down. So, the ISU-152K, to all intents and purposes, in this location. The AMX sneaking up on them. The ISU actually misses the Indian Panzer, and the CDA manages to finish off the ISU-152K. And I was looking, I was feeling absolutely chuffed. Can you believe the comeback? And the comeback in this tank was because of its out 
outrageous capacity for destruction in scenarios where your opponents just don't really, well, they take it for granted is what I'm trying to suggest. Other tank destroyers, such as the G-Saw, you fire four rounds and then you have to sit behind a rock for 40 seconds, hoping that your opponents give you enough time to be able to reload. This tank, there's, there's no hope. There's just raw firepower. Now, sure, it doesn't have an autoloader. It's not going to be able to burst something down as quickly as a G-Saw. I'm not saying that it's like a, a G-Saw within that regard. A G-Saw can do 1,280 damage in six seconds. This vehicle wouldn't have even managed to reload the third shell, so it will have only been able to do 500. So it is going to get out DPM'd by a G-Saw for those bursty combats. But this sustained output of this vehicle, combined with the fabulous penetration that you have on this tank that can deal with anything that's in front of it, and I was just absolutely chuffed. You'll see that I was telling my LTTB, try and finish and uh, try and regain the mid ridge. Um, and, uh, the, and I said, good luck. And then eventually I was like, well played team, what a comeback. I was like really chuffed with this battle. And you could immediately see I was kind of chuffed with this tank. So in the next half an hour, why don't I show you a few of the games that uh, really started to cement my opinion of this vehicle. All right, so let's roll out on steps, and this time we're playing against uh, a good chunk of tier nine tanks as well. So the matchmaking, not nearly as nice as it previously was. So I'm gonna use this vehicle to try and race forwards, get into a bush, see if I can maybe try and harass some of the light tanks or even just provide any kind of opportunity to hit any of the medium tanks that may be ill-prepared. And there is the Udares, and I make a bit of a misplay at the start of this game. I try to cheekily get an HE shell in. But you know what, investing in HE in this tank and going from 250 to 420 is actually a, a significant upgrade. It's, it's not like other HE shells where it's probably not worth investing in trying to get that HE pen in. And hopefully our HE shell is going to go after this HWK, but it looks like it misses his armor. Let's see if we can manage to put the second one in. And there we go, 436 damage. With this rate of fire? Are you just kidding me? I I, I don't know. Uh, Wargaming's balancing department uh, sometimes does some fairly dubious things. For me personally, and my kind of playstyle, and my vibe with this tank, and my, my use of intuition, and my, my aggressive playstyle, this thing has all of the statistics that I want to voraciously cut up my opponents. It is an absolute incredible tank from that regard. So I'm going to switch out to a high explosive anti-tank shell here to try and dump it in on the top of the T-30 turret. And luckily, it doesn't quite manage to go in. So in this situation, I can just be a little bit chill, try and get some support fire. At the end of the day, that's what this tank is. It's a support fire tank that will also manage to get some shells in occasionally in close quarters combat. Unfortunately, that Czechoslovakian heavy tank, the Škoda T-56, that's a very scary vehicle, right? That thing's hitting for uh, 460, is it not? Uh, or is it 440? No, it's not 440, it's 460. Gosh, I always seem to think in my mind, like there's no way it's actually got 460 alpha damage. 460 with an autoloader? That is pretty scary. But uh, how about a tank like this that also doesn't even have to reload because it isn't an autoloader? So we managed to lock down the tracks of the Škoda T-56. Just look at the gun handling that this tank has. This isn't with vertical stabilizers. Obviously, it's a tank destroyer. This isn't with a ro rotation device. This is just with regular equipment. I'm using a bounty turbo, but I'm using a regular rammer and I'm using a regular coated optics on this tank. I really wanted to use standard equipment to give you an idea of what you would be able to achieve on this vehicle. Albeit, I do have a very nice crew. But uh, what, how far do we how far do we push down the barriers of what I'm what I'm allowed to play with inside the reviews? All right, so we've shut down the Škoda T56, and I tell the Progetto 46, help me out, mate, and I'm going to go after this E75. I've got 260 millimeters of pen, which will easily allow me to go through the E75. And what more do you want? Incredible DPM, incredible mobility, fully traversable turret, and how about even maybe HE shells so that we can be able to guarantee kill the SU-130 PM? Well, drat. Unfortunately, we just managed to miss there, but I believe the SU did as well, which means I'm guaranteed to kill him with my 420 alpha damage. Do you see how this thing can explode? It's a tank that isn't durable. You don't want to get into situations where you're caught out by multiple tanks. But if you can control the engagement, wait, and then explode in a scenario, this 
thing is voracious. And what I was able to do with this tank was just... It was, it was, I'd say it was overpowered. But the problem is, is that when I'm trying to make like a judgment on a vehicle like this, I think it's just got an incredibly high carry potential and an incredibly high skill cap. I can imagine these things in the hands of very dangerous players are going to be horrendously good. But on the other hand, I can definitely imagine that the, the more average and the below average players are going to struggle because they won't have set it up correctly. They won't have the crew skills available. They won't think about using bushes. They won't think about when is the time to push the tempo and attack. They won't be able to survive because of the armor and they might not even have the alpha damage on the gun to be able to make the trades that this tank needs to. So maybe I was a little bit too aggressive there. Pushing forwards, my camera rating held up initially but then fell uh, fell fell off and I was unfortunate that the CS-52 lease combined with the UDES were able to get a couple of shots. I was very lucky that they low rolled however. So I'm going to put my first shot towards the T-30 there. I'm quite surprised that shell didn't go in but we've got a second shell to follow it up but the ELC finishes him off. So I'm going to put one into the Skoda T-56 here but I guess I'm not aiming properly right now and look at these HE shells. 388, 5 second reload and then we would have followed it up for another 400 if somebody else hadn't managed to hit it just absolutely scary stuff how much damage this thing can put out so darn quickly and to have this kind of accuracy at this stage oh it's just it's ridiculous it's ridiculous this is um probably one of the most scary tanks that i've played in a long time but you know how i love my flexible tanks you know how i love my damage per minute this thing it's as almost as if they designed it for me the only thing that really seriously concerns me about this vehicle is how annoying it's going to have to be to have an entire dedicate, dedicated crew for just a single tank. Let's take a look to see what we can do to this IS-6 Black Edition here. Unfortunately, I might have aimed a touch low there. I should have aimed a little bit higher, but it doesn't even really matter if you're missing when you've got this kind of rate of fire. Well, of course it does matter. You don't want to miss your shots, but just it's outrageous. It's like it's an autoloader, but it's not an autoloader. So we're going to come around the corner here, put a round into the UDES, and this is where having that flexible turret is just wonderful. Put a second round in. I probably could have penetrated a high explosive round there, so maybe a little bit of a misplay. And we cheekily try and go for another shot on the CS-52 lease, but we get a little bit of spotting to go with our 4,500 damage in this six minute game. How about another one? Okay, so we're loading in here and I'm going to take my second equipment loadout where I'm going to drop the turbo to use the concealment module instead. This is going to get me up to about that 28-29% camo um, again, I'm not using a bounty uh, exhaust. If you wanted to be able to pump it up a little bit further, you could use a bounty exhaust if that's your kind of thing. I've been really enjoying using exhaust on a wide variety of tanks that like to snipe. If I can, contri if I can try and control the engagement by not being spotted by my opponents, then how can they possibly manage to outsnipe me? And this vehicle, it is kind of, it kind of does feel a bit like a, a leopard. Uh, within that regard, or like the the RHM, um, as I was talking about the not the RHM, sorry, the the Kampfpanzer, uh, the Tier Eight German medium tank. It has that kind of flavour to it, that kind of vibe. And if it had the gun depression as well, well, this thing would probably be the most broken tank in the game to play. I'm not saying it's not broken. Um, it's really hard for me. I in my tank reviews, I, what I like to do is I try to as objectively as possible assess the statistics and then let you know about how the tank feels to play. And then I try to think of it from a perspective of players who are very strong and then players who are average or below average. I feel like that's all that I can do. Uh, it's, it's not really fair of me after not seeing how the whole of the player base is going to play it, whether I think that it's going to be outrageously overpowered. What I am going to say is that this tank has all of the statistics to do absolutely crazy things inside World of Tanks. And it has all of the statistics that I want to destroy games through plays like you're going to be seeing me making. Now, this isn't me. Just I didn't go out and play this, play this tank for three hours and then be able to cherry pick the best games. Look how my exhaust is actually going to allow me to stay hidden there against the T-77. That's wild. The games that you're seeing, all three of them that you're going to be seeing today, are games that pretty much happened within about half an hour of each other, or thereabouts. The first half an hour, hour of 
gameplay. This thing just consistently banged out big games. It has every statistic that you would want. So what's this T-77 to do now? Is he going to stop and try and shoot at me? Well, I can see he's actually got a dead gunner right now. So I'm going to take all the chances that I can. And if any of you are wondering, how can you tell he's got a dead gunner? How did it come up in the middle of your screen? That's actually a commander skill called Eagle Eye that not a lot of people end up taking. As I am on my press account, as you can see, the WAPA 2022 underscore one, uh, I do have a lot of the other crew skills that maybe you wouldn't focus on. But that was actually quite a nice advantage there to be able to uh, see that they had a dead gunner. I mean, I would have just continued to sat there and fire at them anyway. Maybe the T-77 is one of the most dangerous tanks you'll ever have to face in those kind of short, bursty combats. But um, still, this thing is, is definitely one of them as well. It's got that raw firepower unload, a lot like a TS-5, but it just uses it in a different way. While with a TS-5, what I try to do is just sit in front of my opponents and hope that my armor works. This vehicle, instead I'm using my mobility and I'm using my flexibility to outpace them, to outmaneuver them, and then be able to outgun them. And oh dear, G-Saw, the ultimate counter for this tank, but now that I see that he's missed one shell, he's not going to be able to get all of the others. Somehow they managed to bounce a shell, uh, and then they ram themselves for uh, a good amount of damage, actually. They managed to ram me for 545, so you don't want to get rammed in this tank, but I did 393 damage to them as well. We managed to finish off the Lorraine with an extra shot, and just like that, we're at 3,700 damage in three and a half minutes. Well, just coming up for four minutes. This thing is voracious, boys and girls. I'm gonna go for a cheeky HE pen here on the Progetto, although it's only 98 damage as somebody else managed to finish them off. What we saw this game is that this vehicle can kind of just do whatever it wants. It has the mobility of a light tank, it has the firepower of a tank destroyer, and it has the flexibility of a medium tank. The only thing that it doesn't have is the durability. And this is a very big profile, an easy thing to hit. This is the definition of glass cannon in World of Tanks. And if you're able to, um, to live on that edge and push it to the limit in this vehicle, there is pretty much no comparison at tier eight. Consequently, I went on an absolute tear with this tank. In under an hour, I'd managed to smash out five ace tankers, although I'd say that one or two of them would not be aces when the vehicle was released, crushing big damage game after big damage game and mopping up lots of kills to boot. And the game which I had a bad result in on Siegfried Line was where I, I pretty much got one shot by a T-30 who I think ended up penetrating me with a high explosive round. So you do have to watch out for that with your gun shield and your all-round weak armor. There are a few things that I want to highlight, however. If, like in that last game, you don't fire any gold rounds, you do make a good amount of profit. But be warned that in games where you even have to fire a few gold rounds, it quickly digs into your profit making in this tank. When you get into those tier 10 rounds, where you're going to be wanting to use your high explosive anti-tank rounds against the, the high tier heavies on the enemy team, doesn't feel right to be spending pretty much 5,000 credits to only do 250 damage. So to conclude, I think the TVP 100 for a player like me and my playstyle is going to be an incredible tank. However, I think that it's going to have a huge amount of disparity surrounding it as well. I think players who get this, who don't really know what they're going to get themselves in for, I'm just not going to have the knowledge of game mechanics to be able to make this thing shine. However, its carry potential is outrageous, and players who do know those mechanics... Personally, for me, I think this has got to be one of the best tier 8 tanks in the game. Do I think the vehicle's overpowered? In the hands of a good player, yes, I think this thing is crazy overpowered, and I think that Wargaming could have massively worsened its statistics in quite a few areas, like its gun handling, its raw firepower, or its mobility, and it would have still been an interesting tank. However, I also feel that the... Lower end of the player base are going to drag the statistics of this down significantly to the point where it's going to be a very good tank, but its statistics aren't going to shine out that much when you take a look at the holistic average. Now I want to talk about a few things that I, I really don't like about this vehicle. Firstly, that it's a Czechoslovakian tank destroyer and that Wargaming have told the community contributors that we can tell you that they have no plans for a Czechoslovakian tank destroyer tree. 
And so do you really want to invest your time in getting an entire new crew on a tank that maybe isn't even going to have a line inside the game. Honestly, Wargaming could have just made this a medium tank, but I guess they want to generate some hype and excitement around it. The other thing that I want to mention is that while this tank is currently under NDA, the event that you're going to be able to get this vehicle, I'm not going to know about it before the NDA is released for this tank review. Now, it's going to be the reward for the, the bonus battle pass stage. Which, to me, kind of sounds like it's just like another mission marathon. And so I have no idea how hard it's going to be to build to get this tank, or alternatively, how much it will cost if you don't have the time to put into the event. And so I really hate making tank reviews on exciting new vehicles when I don't even know how much they're going to cost or have an idea of how long you're going to be able to get them. So I'll, I'll try and make an entire other video on that to give you an idea of tips and tricks for it. But again, I have no idea whether it's going to be useful or appropriate. All I'm doing to going to do today is give you a full tank review of this so that you could know how good the vehicle is and especially how to be able to counter this tank. Countering this vehicle is all about trying to take advantage of its weak armor. Don't be baited into shooting at it like this unless you've got 120 millimeter of its side scraping. You can manage to penetrate this kind of under flap here and overmatch it with all 60 millimeter caliber guns. So do that if you feel like you've got a clean shot. And if you've got really good high explosive rounds, you probably can penetrate the gun shield. If not, you're going to have to just make do with your AP. Realize that this thing is going to most likely have a better rate of fire than you unless you have an autoloader. And so just trade one for one with it and try to force it to have to expose itself or maybe commit to the situation that maybe it doesn't want to. So to all intents and purposes, kind of play as if you're combating an autoloader. So ladies and gents, boys and girls, that's it for today. Really hope you enjoyed this full tank review. If you did, make sure you give the video a thumbs up. If you hated it, give it a thumbs down. And let me know what you think about the TVP100. Do you think this thing looks just absolutely outrageously overpowered? Or do you think the big size and the weak armor is going to be a holdback on the vehicle from being outrageously good? And as always, thank you so much for watching. You've been epic and hopefully I'll see you soon.